Through the centuries, we have seen dark nights as a result of sin. This state is what has been installed in the spiritual condition of man, who cannot distinguish between what is right and wrong. We live in a world where egocentrism shines with its own light in the hearts of people who have no fear of God. Man today believes himself to be competent and very self-sufficient. This arrogance has caused some in their insolent imagination to claim to be similar to the Creator. A story that should make us reflect on this is the story of Nimrod. Many may wonder who was Nimrod and what role did he play in the construction of the Tower of Babel. Find out in this video where we explore the history, myth, and cultural significance of this character, who for many is legendary. Before delving into this topic, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell so that YouTube notifies you every time we publish a new video. Let's start. Nimrod is an intriguing character. As for his character, both the Bible and traditions give us information about his person. What makes it intriguing is that, of the list of Noah's descendants, he is the only one whose achievements are mentioned, although rather in passing. We'll talk a little about possible historical parallels, examine what the biblical text says, and briefly mention some of the post-biblical speculation about it. The figure of Nimrod appears briefly in the Bible. In chapter 10 of Genesis, we have a perfect record of the families descended from Noah, and also of the kingdoms and nations that the new settlers of the world founded. In verses 8 and 10, special mention is made of Nimrod, and although this character is named only four times in all of Holy Scripture, he occupies a prominent position in the biblical pages. Let's read verses 8 through 12 of chapter 10 of Genesis. And Cush begat Nimrod, who became the first mighty man on earth. This man was a mighty hunter before Jehovah, therefore it is said, just like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From this land he went out to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, which is a great city. The story of the genealogy refers in a very special way to one of the sons of Cush, who became one of the most prominent men of his time. This was Nimrod. The first thing that is said about him is that he was the first powerful man on earth, meaning that he was the first of that class. The word powerful means, as the passage indicates, that he possessed political and military power. With him, a new generation of leaders began whose intention was to become increasingly powerful. In second place, he is described as a mighty hunter before Jehovah. The context shows that this is not praise for Nimrod. The idea is that Nimrod was an offense before the face of God. Now, after the flood in the land of Shinar, the Tigers and Euphrates rivers had stored rich deposits of soil that could produce grain in abundance. However, there were certain disadvantages which the people who inhabited that land had to face. This was overpopulated with wild animals, which were a constant danger to its safety and peace. Anyone who could provide protection against these savage beasts would receive great outcry from their people. This disadvantage made Nimrod famous among those primitive people. Nimrod established a system to obtain better protection. Instead of constantly fighting with wild beasts, why not organize people into cities and surround them with walls to protect themselves? So why not organize these cities into a kingdom and choose a king to reign over them? This was Nimrod's thought, because the Bible tells us that he organized such a kingdom. And so the kingdom of Nimrod was established as the first kingdom mentioned in sacred scripture. The heads of his kingdom. It refers to the ancient cities of Babel, Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the region called Shinar in Lower Mesopotamia. From there, Nimrod headed north to possess the land of Assyria in Upper Mesopotamia. In Micah chapter 5, verse 6, it says, And they will devastate the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod with their swords. From this passage from Micah, we deduce that Assyria was still considered the land of Nimrod. The historian Flavius Josephus identifies him as a haughty man, 
who rebelled against God and ruled with cruelty the cities he governed. He persuaded his subjects not to attribute their strength to God, as if through him they were happy, but to believe that it was their own efforts that brought them that happiness. Hence, many believe that the name Nimrod means we rebel. This seems to indicate that Nimrod was more than just a skilled animal hunter. On the contrary, it shows him openly obstinate against God himself. He waged a battle against God for the faithfulness of men. He was blatantly against God. Nimrod was rebelliously against God, having the same lust for power that Lucifer had during his attempted heavenly power coup. The spirit of slavery had already found a human vehicle, Nimrod. This one not only hunted animals, but also hunted the souls of men. He hunted and enslaved their souls to follow his pernicious ways. No wonder the Apostle Peter preached, be saved from this perverse generation. Now, as we mentioned previously, the Bible tells us that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And it was in this land where the famous Tower of Babel was built. After man had multiplied, chapter 11 of Genesis tells us that they located in the east, on a plain in the land of Shinar. This plain was located between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in Mesopotamia, and it was here where Nimrod, the first governor of these lands, built great cities, which is why it is believed that Nimrod was the promoter of the construction of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod became powerful on earth, he was a famous leader in world events. He was so powerful, and the impression he made on the minds of men was so great that the East is currently full of traditions of his extraordinary exploits. Nimrod appears as a character in the mythology of many ancient cultures. He appears in Hungarian, Greek, Arab, Syrian, and Armenian legends. There is evidence that the myth of Hercules and the Epic of Gilgamesh have their origin in the life of Nimrod. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest work of epic literature ever discovered, written on clay tablets. It focuses on the great warrior King Gilgamesh, who, depending on the version, was sometimes portrayed as part god due to his powerful deeds. Although Gilgamesh was portrayed as a hero, he was also ruthless and depraved. This powerful warrior tyrant king fits well with the description of Nimrod. In part of the epic, Gilgamesh speaks with Utnapishtim, a man who survived a great flood sent by the gods by building a ship under the command of the god Ea, seeking to learn immortality from him. Utnapishtim tells a story very similar to the Genesis narrative. This makes sense if it is Nimrod talking to his grandfather Ham or his great-grandfather Noah. Elsewhere in the epic, Gilgamesh sets out to kill the being that caused the flood. This aligns with Nimrod's challenge to God. According to historian Josephus, Nimrod said he would take revenge on God if he wanted to drown the world again. For that he would build a tower too high so that the waters would not reach it, and that she would take revenge on God for destroying his ancestors. Now let's see what the Bible tells us about man's thinking when building the Tower of Babel. Let's read Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 to 4. Then the whole earth had one language and the same words. And it came to pass, when they came out from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, Come on, let's make brick and bake it with fire. And he served them brick instead of stone and asphalt instead of mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, whose top will reach to heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Building a city and a tower was not in itself a sin. The sin was that this was in opposition to God's purpose of filling the earth, and that in all the plans of these men there was not a thought for their God. They did not look for him or take him into account at all. They gathered together to act independently of God, seeking to create for themselves a reputation as great, to make a name for themselves. This was the first godless confederation or association. And if we look at the history of recent years, we will see a large and varied number of these associations, anarchism, communism, nihilism, socialism, etc. But it is important not to forget that the first of all was that of the Plain of Sinar, and we must not lose sight of the fact that they intended, as all associations of the same kind have since attempted, 
to promote the interests of humanity and exalt the name of man. Even so, since they excluded God, failure and confusion were the result of their tremendous efforts. The story of Nimrod was an example of human pride and ambition that opposes the will of God. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it says, Pride comes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Nimrod wanted to make a name and an empire at the cost of disobeying God and oppressing his fellow men. This warns us that we must humble ourselves before God and seek his glory and not our own. Nimrod was the precursor of the Antichrist, the future world ruler who will rise up against God and his people in the end times. The book of Revelation tells us about the great Babylon, the political religious system that will dominate the world under the leadership of the Antichrist and that will be destroyed by God in his wrath. Babylon is much more than a city. It is a spirit. It is the spirit of Nimrod. It is a rebellion. It is a rebellion against all that is good, against God himself. This alerts us that we must be attentive to the signs of the times and not be deceived by false doctrines and false teachers. Every time God raises up a testimony on earth, Satan has a Babylon to damage that testimony. In the Old Testament, Babylon opposes Israel. In the New, Babylon opposes the church. Nimrod continues to exist, not only in the story of Babel and on religious altars, it also continues to exist covertly in the hearts of men who wish to make a name for themselves and who wish to reach heaven by their own inventiveness. However, God cannot be reached by human works, but only by faith in the Son of God. Just as happened with the adventure of Nimrod and Babel, Babel was built on the extensive plain south of Mesopotamia. Since stone was scarce in Mesopotamia, they built with brick made of hardened, baked clay. With this material, they raised Babel. The men wanted to achieve two goals, make a name and reach heaven. They were filled with ambition for power, pride, and rebellion, but God came down to see what they were doing and confused their languages. This was the judgment of God, indicating that God was not in it, nor could he agree. Dear listener, all other adventures of this kind will equally fail. God who receives the humble always rejects the proud and arrogant. The Nimrods have no chance of being received by God, Babylon neither. Now, as we have already said, the end of man's first association without God was failure and confusion. And this is in marked contrast to the progressive development and ultimate glory of God's association that is, his church, founded not by powerful hunters like Nimrod, but by Jesus of Nazareth, not by force of arms, but by the power of his word and the value of his sacrifice. And this church, whose foundation is Christ and whose only head is also the glorified Christ, is that of which it is written, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The story of Nimrod is a tragic story, but also a hopeful story. Tragic because it shows us sin and man's rebellion against God. Hopeful because it shows us the grace and power of God to frustrate the plans of the evil one and fulfill his eternal purposes. Finally, Nimrod, the priest king of Babylon, died. According to legends, his body was cut into pieces and burned, and the pieces were sent to various areas. Similar practices are mentioned in the Bible. Nimrod's death was greatly mourned by the people of Babylon. But even when Nimrod had died, the Babylonian religion, in which he had such a prominent part, continued and developed further, under the leadership of his wife. After Nimrod's death, his wife, Queen Semiramis, proclaimed him the solar god. Later, when this adulterous and idolatrous woman gave birth to an illegitimate son, she proclaimed that her son, Tammuz by name, was nothing more than Nimrod himself reborn. Now the queen mother of Tammuz, without a doubt, had heard the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, who would be born of a woman, since this truth was well known from the beginning as we can see in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Satan had first deceived a woman, Eve, but later through a woman, the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, would come. Satan, the great counterfeiter, 
also knew much about the divine plan. It was thus that he began to supplant falsehoods about the true plan, centuries before the coming of Jesus. Queen Semiramis, as an instrument in the hands of Satan, claimed that her son was conceived in a supernatural way and that he was the promised seed, the savior of the world. But not only was the little one adored, but also the woman, the mother, he was also equally, or more, than his son. The prophet Ezekiel told us about Tammuz. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 14 and 16. So he took me to the north gate of the temple of the Lord. Some women were sitting there, sobbing for the god Tammuz. Have you seen this? He asked me. But I will show you even more detestable sins. Then he took me to the inner court of the temple of the Lord. At the entrance to the sanctuary, between the antechamber and the bronze altar, there were about twenty-five men with their backs to the sanctuary of the Lord. They were leaning towards the east, worshipping the sun. If God allows it, as we will see in another video, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz were used by Satan to produce a false religion, which sometimes seems to be like the true one, and their corrupt system filled the world. Most Babylonian idolatry was carried through symbols. That is why it was a mystery religion. The golden calf, for example, was a symbol of Tammuz, son of the solar god. As Nimrod was considered to be the solar god or Baal, fire was considered his representative on earth. Candlesticks and fires were lit. Nimrod was also symbolized through solar symbols, fish, trees, columns, and animals. Centuries later, Paul gave a description that perfectly details the path the people of Babylon followed. The apostle wrote, For when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor give thanks to him, but their thoughts became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of corruptible man, of birds, of four-footed animals, and of reptiles. Therefore God also gave them over to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts, so that they dishonored their own bodies among themselves. Since they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, honoring and worshiping the creatures rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to shameful passions. Now, let us pass through the centuries to the last days. The evil, seductive spirit of Nimrod and Babylon continues its course today. As we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, we see another individual. This is called the man of sin, the son of perdition, or better known as the Antichrist. This man is the archetype of rebellion, which opposes and rises up against God, exposing the attitude of Lucifer and Nimrod. His brazen audacity will lead him to sit in the temple posing as God. He will captivate others in their evil ways and according to Revelation chapter 13, he will make everyone worship him, requiring them to have the mark of the beast, and his number is 666. Slavery will continue until Jesus Christ in his second coming will come to put an end to the dominion of men, and his dominion is eternal dominion, which will never pass away, and his kingdom one that will not be destroyed. And so we come to the end of this video. Thank you for being part of our channel. God bless you greatly. Until the next video.